All right, uh, welcome to the January 2023 Collaboration Cafe webinar, which is sponsored by the Midwest Big Data Innovation Hub with support from the National Science Foundation. I'm John McMullen, I'm the Executive Director of the Midwest Big Data Hub, and today we'll be exploring the NSF's Mid-Career Advancement Program with uh, guests that we're very fortunate to have. Uh, very happy to welcome Dr. Eleanor Sayre, uh, who is a Program Director at NSF. Uh, and has responsibility in part for uh, the MCA program. We are also uh, very fortunate to have three prior awardees of the MCA program who are kind enough to be here today to talk about their experiences uh, developing proposals and, and uh, how that uh, award has impacted their uh, research in their careers. Uh, so we have Dr. Jennifer Gleason of the University of Kansas Center for Research. Uh, Dr. Zhaoja Lin, uh, Nina Lin from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and Dr. Chris Bartlett from the Research Institute at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Ohio. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Uh, it's, it's fantastic to have you here and, and be able to share your perspectives in participating in this, this uh, program. All right, so the plan for today is to give you uh, a, a brief summary of the MCA program, uh, but really reserve most of our time to talk with our guests and with audience members about uh, the interests and experiences that folks have. Um, for those of you who are new uh, to this webinar series and, and new to the Midwest Hub community, um, I'll give a quick overview of who we are and what we do. Um, so we are part of a national network of four innovation hubs uh, that have been funded by NSF since 2015. Um, and we are really focused on building communities and, and collaborations around data science and related STEM areas, uh, particularly in the Midwest region that we uh, are responsible for. But uh, in collaboration with the other three hubs, uh, we have a pretty active national network and, and footprint of activities as well. So. For those of you watching the recording uh, outside of the Midwest area, uh, we encourage you to reach out to the hub that is in your geographic region and, and look at uh, the activities that they have and, and consider getting involved with those as well. Um, here in the Midwest, this is a regional partnership of six universities uh, led here at the University of Illinois, uh, but uh, with, with partner institutions across the region. Um, and the work that we do is really based on the regional strengths and community interests that we have here in the Midwest. Uh, so topics like digital agriculture, water quality, uh, big data in health, for example, uh, are, are topics that we have had uh, as our themes for quite a while, but really through the lens of data science education, workforce development, uh, and cyber infrastructure as sort of grounding the, the ideas that we work from. Um, we've had a lot of input from the community about the need for uh, ways to bring together people from different disciplines and, and across different institutions and sectors to think about responding to proposal uh, opportunities. And so this webinar series is one way that we support uh, those needs and, and that we help support development uh, of new collaborations and new uh, proposals. So um, uh, we do welcome uh, uh, your ideas and thoughts for which topics we address uh, through this series and which solicitations we look at. Um, it is a monthly series and we encourage folks to uh, send us feedback about what would be useful uh, for us to cover here. We, we have uh, done quite a bit around early career uh, research support and so today we're, we're moving uh, further down that career path and looking at folks who are more established in their careers as well. Uh, and so, yeah, we do encourage folks to, to uh, send along uh, ideas that you'd like to see us explore and, uh, you know, join us uh, in some of the other resources that we have for this series. Uh, we have our, our website with our schedule. Uh, we have a Slack community for folks to engage uh, offline. Uh, and of course, our YouTube playlist of, of prior recordings as well. Um, I will note that the slides that I am going through here uh, are available on our website now. I'll go ahead and put that uh, link into the chat for folks if you would like to uh, take a, a deeper look at the, the content here, but I'm going to move pretty quickly through uh, uh, that information. I'll also note here that we 
uh, do engage with uh, individuals and institutions on proposals uh, ourselves. We, we lead proposals, but we also function as a collaborator uh, in different ways. And so if you have data science um, elements for your uh, work uh, that you'd like to talk with us about, we'd be happy to have that conversation about how we might be able to support you uh, in those activities. Uh, but for today, let's move ahead and talk about our solicitation uh, of interest. So this is the Mid-Career Advancement Program. Um, I will go ahead and put in the link directly to uh, the NSF uh, program page for that. Um, uh, I feel like if you are on this call, you are probably uh, interested in this program and may have looked at it previously, but uh, the information that we have here in the slides comes directly from that solicitation. Uh, and we will get into some of the details of that uh, program here. All right, so uh, these proposals for this particular cycle are due uh, in a window that opens on February 1st and closes on March 1st. So uh, if you haven't already started uh, developing your proposal, you have uh, another month or so to do that. Um, overall, uh, this uh, program from, from an SF point of view is really designed to uh, ensure that faculty who are moving through their careers and, and picking up more responsibilities outside of their research uh, area uh, in terms of service and committees and, and teaching, um, making sure that they have time uh, uh, and capacity to continue their research program, continue to involve that over time and grow that in new directions. Uh, uh, you know, accounting for the other work that you have to do as a, uh, a tenured faculty member. Um, there, there also seems to be a strong push at NSF through this program and through others to uh, ensure that the, the scientific workforce and, and faculty uh, across institutions is more diverse uh, and, and includes folks who may have been pushed out of the workforce uh, historically due to uh, some of those, uh, as they say, things that impinge upon careers. So it could be uh, demands of, of the position, it could be family uh, considerations, uh, disabilities, uh, other, other constraints on careers that uh, this program is trying to overcome. Um, I want to, to go to uh, Eleanor here. Do, would you like to say anything else from NSF's perspective about what the goals are for this program? Sure, me too. Hi folks, I'm delighted to chat about this. Thank you for inviting me. Of course. Um, uh, the first thing that I wanna say is that MCA has a new solicitation that just came out. It is different than past solicitations. Um, so if you're thinking about applying, read what's current to make sure you're being responsive to what's the current solicitation. Um, we think about MCA as a program as really supporting the researcher. And for many mid-career faculty, they, their research programs have stalled out because of increased teaching and service responsibilities, or their research skills have become a little stale, or they're thinking about pivoting into a new and exciting direction. And they really need protected time to do that professional growth. And so that is that is the heart of MCA. Um, and we're really, really excited to support PIs who, um, who fit that as a profile. Great, thanks very much for that additional detail there. So let's look at some of the, the details of this program. Um, this this looks a little bit different from other NSF programs in terms of you know research, research uh, project related kinds of programs uh, in terms of the uh, the funding that is available uh, in particular. So this is is up to three years um, uh, in terms of the the duration of this program. And, and Eleanor, I'm using the the 22-603 solicitation. Is that the most current one? Okay, great. Um, so all of what you'll see here from me today comes directly from that solicitation. Um, 
There is, uh, we can talk a little more about the budget in a bit here, but there is uh, a $100,000 direct cost uh, cap. Um, uh, and that, there, there is some guidance about what you should include in that. Um, that does include, for example, uh, uh, travel to the PI meeting uh, and, and support for your uh, collaborators if you have them. Uh, but there is also uh, salary uh, support for the PI, uh, and that is going to vary based upon the person's uh, individual salary and the institution that they're at, things like that, the benefit package and so forth. Um, so there isn't a, a hard number, as far as I can see in the solicitation, that you are restricted to other than that 100K uh, cap. And so there does appear to be some negotiation that you can uh, work with NSF on uh, in terms of your overall budget. Well, well hmm. no. No? <laughs> the, rules, the rules are very strict. There's not a lot of room for negotiation. But these rules are different than almost all the other NSF programs out there where we tell you what your budget cap is. Here, we're telling you what your time cap is, right. what your direct cost cap is, not including your time. And this is because one of the things we've learned is that you know different institutions have different overhead rates. Mm -hmm. And especially at mid-career, different faculty have wildly different salary. We want you to protect, we want to protect your time, whatever your time costs. So this is, these are, these are hard rules. You don't get to bend them, but, but they're different rules than a standard NSF proposal. That's right. And I should be clear that that six and a half months of time and that 100k is over the total period of the award. So that can be up to three years, it can be less, but um, that is not an annual amount that you have available to you. Um, we'll talk a little more about the, the collaborator uh, element here, but um, Eleanor, can you clarify, is there a maximum number of, of partners and collaborators you can have that the, the solicitation reads as being one or more, but what, what guidance do you have there? You're required to have one, and, and that, that person can have up to one month of, of, of salary, which could be summer salary or mm -hmm. AY salary, depending on their position. Um, you may have other collaborators, but if you are moving budget to them, that comes out of your 100K direct cost. Got it. All right, and we will talk more about what that that uh, relationship with their collaborators looks like in a little bit here, but thank you, that's, that's helpful. Um, this is a pretty large program. We're talking about 35 to 45 anticipated awards made each cycle, so uh, you have a better chance uh, uh, at this, you know, presumably than you would at, at programs that have a much smaller number of awards. Um, but it is very competitive, obviously, as well. Um, you do not have to uh, prepare a letter of intent or a pre-proposal. Uh, but as you, as you read the solicitation, you'll see that it's very important to understand what directorate your research is aligning with uh, and reaching out to a program officer uh, who uh, works with the MCA program, but is also in, in one of those directorates and programs to understand how your research would fit into the goals of that uh, group. So keep that in mind as well. Um, in terms of the eligibility, you must be at the associate professor rank or whatever the equivalent is at your institution. And you must have uh, at least three years of time within that role by the time you submit this uh, proposal. Um, we'll talk in a minute about the new track that is um, focused on uh, faculty at predominantly undergrad institutions. Uh, those folks um, are able to be up to the full professor rank or whatever the equivalent is there. Um, and so that is a little different from the, the main track. And so we'll talk about what, um, what those restrictions are. Um, and NSF does call out uh, the fact that they would like more uh, applications from folks in EPSCOR jurisdictions uh, as well, uh, of which we have several here in the Midwest. And so keep that in mind uh, if you are uh, uh, in a state where that uh, comes into play. All right. So 
as we have seen in a lot of NSF solicitations that we've looked at, there is a lot of guidance in that text. Uh, it's really important to spend some time reading through uh, all the details there, understand what, what they're asking you to provide uh, and what the timeline is for those elements, because uh, there are uh, pieces here that, as we'll see, that uh, come from folks other than yourself uh, and, and your institution. And so uh, making sure that you read through the full text and understand what the, uh, the boundaries are is really important. Um, this is a multi-directorate program, and so there are multiple uh, units at NSF who are interested in seeing proposals uh, that align with the work that they do. And so those are listed here. Uh, and that does include the new TIP directorate, the Technology Innovation and Partnerships uh, directorate that was established last year, uh, as well as the Office of Integrative Activities, which is more of a cross-cutting uh, directorate at the foundation. So we have some quotes here from directly from the solicitation that talk about, um, again, the goals for this program uh, and specifically what um, uh, partners, for example, are uh, expected, what kind of roles they're expected to play here. Um, when, whenever you see something in a solicitation that is both italicized and bolded, uh, I take that to mean it's pretty important. And so uh, in our first paragraph here, you know, they're talking about this being a really substantial enhancement to uh, a proposer's career trajectory. So uh, not just continuing their career, but really trying to uh, grow uh, in new ways and, and establish themselves in a particular field uh, and, and do so uh, in a way that would not be likely without this, without support from this program. Um, a couple of other things that jump out to me here, uh, partnering with people outside of the, the proposer's uh, discipline area is encouraged. So, you know, looking for new opportunities uh, in fields where you don't uh, have a lot of history, taking some risk in new areas uh, and looking for inter interdisciplinary kinds of collaborations um, uh, is encouraged here. Um, I wanted to follow up on that discussion of, of collaborators and how collaborators are important to this program. So um, it is required to have at least one collaborator, but they are uh, only allowed to be consultants or senior personnel on the project. This is not a, a collaborative research um, uh, proposal where they would be a, a co-PI. This is really, again, meant to be focused on a particular researcher's uh, program uh, and how to move that forward. And so uh, that, that can be, uh, I would imagine, tricky to navigate uh, uh, carving out a particular project that is uh, in your focus area, uh, and but but you know finding uh, elements of that that you want to collaborate with others on. We can get into some of the discussions of our guests today about how they navigated that uh, in developing their proposal. All right, and then I wanted to follow up, as I said, on the the track uh, that is focused on predominantly undergrad institutions. Um, uh, so again, if you are at a full professor rank, but affiliated with uh, a PUI, um, there is an opportunity to uh, use this program uh, to develop uh, a proposal if it aligns with either the Biological Sciences Directorate or the Geosciences Directorate. Um, there is some language in the solicitation that gives you more guidance there. They also define uh, in more detail what a PUI is uh, in which um, categories of those schools uh, are covered by this, this track. So there are some restrictions there. Make sure that you read through what those look like. Um, there's also restrictions about the research focus. So for example, NSF uh, historically has not funded a lot of research in, in human health, uh, uh, really, and NIH has been the venue for that. And so even though uh, biological sciences is, is is one of the partners here. Uh, it has to be in scope for the, the work that that directorate funds. So make sure that you are, uh, again, exploring that uh, through the 
the NSF website and, and talking with the program director uh, about the scope of work that you'd like to do. I did want to note that um, NSF has a new foundation-wide program called Granted, uh, which is just now launching and is really focused on building um, capacity for sponsored research at smaller institutions like PUIs uh, and MSIs. And so uh, if you are affiliated with that type of institution, uh, I would encourage you to check out the details of that program. That is sort of an umbrella program that is pulling in things like the EPSCOR program includes uh, TCUP, the, the HBCU programs, um, and really trying to uh, provide some support for uh, institutions to develop capacity for, uh, you know, responding to proposals and, and being able to support the, the implementation of those. So uh, have a look at that if, if that's your situation. Uh, there is a, a series of webinars happening now. Um, the next one is February 23rd, uh, but there was one uh, in the last week or so, and the recording of that is available now as well. All right, so let's talk quickly about um, the, the specific elements of this solicitation. Uh, like I said, it's really important to read through the, the solicitation and, and look at the details that they're providing for these. In particular, um, for the main narrative, there are three sections that are required uh, and, and they provide quite a bit of detail about what exactly they'd like to see uh, in those sections. And so, that's important, again, because it's different from a typical research proposal that you would be submitting. Um, there is a broader impact section where you can talk about uh, how you uh, see the, the work that you're proposing to be impacting society uh, at large. And as we'll see, that's one of the evaluation criteria for the reviewers. Um, obviously, you'll have your references. Uh, and, and they ex explicitly say that you need to cite uh, the work that you're talking about in the, the first section here about the, the prior work that's, that's leading up to this new proposal. Uh, then of course you have your budget and your justification for that. Um, and you know, as we mentioned before, you do have to make sure that you're budgeting for uh, the uh, mandatory awardee meeting as a part of that set of direct costs. You are able to support um, attendance by uh, one of your partners. If you have uh, more than one, you've kind of negotiate that. But uh, if you want to have your partner uh, join that meeting, you can do that as well. There are some supplementary documents uh, uh, in addition to that main narrative. So uh, the impact statement, for example, is one that looks unique to this particular program where you talk about, you know, what are the, the uh, really important takeaways from this work that you anticipate? How is that going to have an impact on your research and on the, the discipline that you're working in? Um, there's a couple of requirements for letters. And again, so looking at the timing of this related to the due date uh, is important. Um, for your partners, um, these letters are more detailed than the standard one sentence uh, NSF letter template. Uh, this really talks to how that partner is going to contribute to your work and uh, what the synergy is between uh, their research area and your particular project. Um, and then your department uh, chair uh, is providing a letter not just about your eligibility for the program, but really how this would help develop your career, you know, how, how your career has gone so far at your institution and how this could impact your trajectory going forward. So very important um, additional uh, support from those uh, collaborators uh, and, and institutional people here. Um, Eleanor, do you want to say anything about the importance of, of what you'd like to see in those letters? Um, sure. So um, the so the standard NSF template, which is, is a very standard template and is very brief and confers almost zero information, is not what we are looking for. Um, in your, uh, from your collab collaborating partner, we are looking for um, a discussion of how this proposed work 
moves your professional trajectory and how it is, uh, you know, good partners, good partnerships are mutually beneficial. So what are they bringing to the table? And how are that, how is that uh, mutually beneficial? From your departmental chairperson, they do need to certify that you're eligible. And a key piece of this is um, to really protect your time. What's the, what's the way that they are protecting your time? How aware are they of the ways in which your time needs to be protected as a part of your proposal? If you are planning to use these funds to buy out of teaching every spring semester, which you can do, are they on board with that? Are you planning to use this as part of a sabbatical? You'll be gone for a whole semester, a whole year. You can do that. Are they on board with it? Is it summer salary? Does that, which means you're not teaching over the summer? Do they know? Are they on board? Um, there's more. There's more details in the solicitation. Um, I also put in the chat, and I can put in the chat again, um, there's an FAQ about the MCA program, which has some, uh, yeah, I mean, it's an FAQ, it has a lot of really commonly asked questions. And there's some, it's, it's, a, it's an additional great source of information as you're trying to figure these things out. Fantastic, thanks very much for that. Um, I am assuming that, as a part of the PAPG requirements, some of the other elements that are not noted in the solicitation, like a facility statement or a data management plan, those are probably going to be required as well. Is that right? Yes, this does not supersede the PAPG. Regular PAPG stuff still applies. There is a difference in that um, in these letters, in this impact statement, and in the length of your pro um, project description. So, yes, the PAPG applies. Also, the solicitation. Also, right, yeah. Great. So, yeah, I see some questions in the chat. Definitely uh, keep those coming. We can we can have a discussion uh, in a few moments here about that. I do want to note that um, although we have uh, actually more than one uh, NSF program officer on the call now, um, they are not able to talk about your specific uh, ideas on this call. Uh, we can definitely talk about general questions, but uh, I do encourage folks to reach out uh, with specific project ideas to uh, NSF uh, offline here. Okay, so, you know, there's some standard, other standard supplementary documents, your, your bio sketch, for example, uh, which, by the way, has been updated uh, in terms of the format recently, so you should uh, re-export your, uh, your bio sketch from CyanCV or wherever you keep it uh, and make sure that that is current. Um, they do request uh, suggested reviewers, so if there are folks within your discipline that you think uh, would be a good reviewer for this project, uh, you know, feel free to suggest those as well. Obviously, if you have a, a conflict with them in terms of being a current collaborator, that could be uh, a challenge. But uh, between the COA document and your, your list of reviewers, you know, that will get negotiated. But um, I thought that was a, a unique uh, element here as well. All right. Uh, a little bit more guidance before we get into the Q&A. So uh, there is quite a bit of detail about uh, how these proposals get reviewed by NSF and the review panel. So uh, I imagine most folks on the call are familiar with NSF and understand the intellectual merit and broader impacts uh, review principles. Those are standard for every uh, proposal and program. For the MCA program in particular, there is a set of additional criteria that the panel will be looking at uh, in, in light of your uh, proposal. And so we won't get through all of these right now, but um, I wanted to mention a couple of things. First, uh, as I said before, if there's something in bold in the solicitation, they do that for a reason. So make sure that you are uh, understanding what uh, is important to them. Um, also here, you can see that they're encouraging folks to uh, build on, on prior work, but also take some risks. Uh, try something new uh, that 
you think builds on your work and is a natural uh, evolution for you, uh, that could, it's okay for that to be risky uh, or, or you don't have a whole lot of preliminary data yet. Um, they, they understand that that is, um, you know, part of that, that evolution of your career that you're gonna try something new and there, there's some risk associated with that. Um, and they also do call out um, synergies with other disciplines and, and collaborations with partners. So again, that is a very important part uh, of the proposal and, and of how it gets evaluated. All right, so uh, I think that is all that I had for the, the breakdown of the solicitation. I'll, I'll turn it to Eleanor for a second here to see if there's anything that I missed, anything else you would like to make sure that the audience is aware of before we get into the, the Q&A session here. That was a fa fabulous introduction. Thank you, John. Um, I'm seeing some stuff zoom by in the chat. So um, I think I'm up to date there but I'm um, happy for more questions. Perfect. So uh, just wanna mention that we do have a couple of other sessions coming up uh, in, in the next couple of months here. Uh, next month, we will look at the NIH uh, Genomic Research for Data Science Program. We have looked at that previously uh, last year. And then in March, we will look at the, the NSF RCN program uh, and how we might use that in the Midwest to develop new data science collaborations uh, with partners. So uh, if you're interested in any of those, uh, we'd be happy to have you come back and join those sessions. And those uh, and others will be up on our website uh, for you to check out. Um, but let's get into some discussion here with our guests. We're very fortunate to have some awardees of this program. Um, and so I have some sort of conversation starter questions here for you guys um, in terms of how uh, participating in this program has impacted, you know, the research that you do, obviously, but also, you know, has it has it informed your teaching to, to try something new and, and uh, have a new collaboration uh, in, a, in that space? Uh, and then, you know, how has that um, driven what you're planning to do uh, for your future career at this point? Um, we can talk, you know, if you had a colleague who was interested in this program, what would you suggest to them now that you have gone through uh, that process of thinking about your proposal, uh, developing that, getting awarded? Uh, what, would you, what would you tell them to, to be mindful of as they start to think about that? Um, and then, you know, if you want to talk about your collaborations and, and how that impacted the work that uh, you did, that that would be great as well. Um, I'm going to I can put those questions in the chat, uh, but I do want to stop um, sharing the screen here so we can see each other and have a good conversation uh, rather than just me talking at you all. So um, maybe we can we can go around the, the room here with uh, Chris and Nina and Jennifer about the uh, the projects that you proposed, uh, how, how different were those from what you were doing previously? Were you were you trying something very new, or was this more of an extension of the work that you were uh, already doing? Uh, I, I guess I can start. Um, I'm a evolutionary biologist. Uh, I work a lot on courtship behavior in Drosophila, fruit flies, and um, I, 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 through this project, I, I'm bringing in a new behavior. I'm looking at female-female aggression um, in flies, which is really understudied. And so my collaborator is an expert on female-female aggression in Drosophila melanogaster. I know a lot about other species. So it, it's a really good um, collaboration in that she has the experience with the behavior. I have the experience with different species and we're kind of trying to take different um, uh, mating systems and ecology of the flies and seeing how that is interacting. My collaboration is a little different because um, she's at the University of Oxford. So um, 
NSF doesn't allow me to have any money go to her. Um, but uh, I spent two weeks there last summer. I'm going for another month in April. I have a full year sabbatical. I mean, how can a full year sabbatical not help your research? You know, it's been great uh, to just concentrate on, on the science this year. That's great. Yeah, thank you for that. Chris or Nina, would you like to say anything about how you positioned your research here? Chris, you want to go first? I felt, oh, okay. <laughs> well, I was going to offer. I was going to offer you to go first. Do you want? I'm, I'm agnostic. Um. Okay, well, I can go first. Yeah, so uh, I'm a um, biochemical engineer. And uh, uh, when I was putting together my proposal, I was at the time I, I really wanted to um, find ways to kind of translate the technology my lab has been developing in microbial engineering to the real world. <laughs> so um, for that, I decided I will do uh, three things. One was I wanted to really uh, go out and connect with the industry. So I ended up sending my proposal to this uh, uh, new directory, TIP. <laughs> uh, there's a program for Partnership for Innovation, PFI, um, which was actually a, a program in engineering previously that I was aware of. So it kind of just fit uh, naturally, I feel. And, and interestingly, PFI actually require um, like an industrial partner in their program. So I think it's now I, well, at that time, I, I basically had to fit into both the PFI requirement and also the MCA requirement. Um, so I, uh, I found people in the industry that had, I already met previously and tried to come up with something that was going to be mutually beneficial. So that was one. And the second, uh, I wanted to learn new, uh, new skills that I, I felt I wasn't having in this really complicated process of uh, translating technology. And in particular, I was very interested in learning more about scaling up uh, fermentation processes. Um, so I, I wanted to find kind of partners kind of in the, in, in the private and the public uh, space, both of that to, to learn that. And then third, I also really felt that um, we'll, I would like to see some of these also in the education and teaching. So incorporating entrepreneurship training in the undergrad and the graduate uh, education uh, in particular, uh, in my department, we have the senior design courses where people or our students are designing products. So I want them to kind of learn some of these as well. So I also found someone in my institution as a partner or collaborator in this area. So I ended up having a lot of <laughs> fun co collaborators. Uh, and I, I've had the award for now about well, less than a year. And I, I felt it's been really helpful in terms of allowing me to explore all of these different things. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very thankful for this. Great, thank you for that. Chris? And uh, I guess I come at it from yet another different angle uh, here. So I'm a, a data scientist who works in bioinformatics. And so our data sets on the larger side, to be sure, not exabytes or something like that, but still large enough that almost anything I want to do, uh, I'm either going to have to wait a long time to get it done, or I can't do it at all. And that's because if you have something that you know is three billion base pairs, if I want to do some kind of a test statistic or something like that on that, it's typically n squared, just to do something simple. And the worst case scenario is you do two to the n computations for something complicated and super interesting. And two to the end, when you have three billion, I mean, it would take longer to run that than there have been seconds since the universe began. And so fighting these exponentials is a real problem for us. So there's a newer technology called quantum computing, 
uh, which is physically realized to a certain degree. They're prototype machines. They're not ready for prime time, but these things really exist. And there's certain types of calculations that can be run exponentially faster on a quantum computer than on a traditional computer. Like I said, these won't be available in the next two or three years or anything like that. They're still off, but these things exist. And it occurred to me, I'd like to spend some time steering my portfolio into doing quantum computing and bioinformatics because it's an open area, it's fascinating, and it's incredibly valuable to the field because there's so many things we want to do that we simply cannot do. And so the problem is I work at a place where they say, that's too theoretical. We don't really want you spending your time on that. But with the MCA award, I could go to my boss and say, there's actually money in this. It's not just playing on a dry erase board. And so it was critical <laughs> to make the case that I really should be spending time on this. There's actual money involved. I will actually become an expert in this over, over the course of three years and, and it will probably be sustainable in the future. And so uh, the MCA was, was essential for me to have that protected time to do this kind of novel training where I'm learning quantum physics and I'm learning uh, computer science relevant to that, which data science is related, but the quantum aspect that is completely outside of where, uh, where I'd ever been before. And so, yeah, for me, the MCA was great uh, from, from that angle, but that's the direction I took. So learning, learning quantum computing relative to, uh, to data science and bioinformatics. Very interesting. Thank you for that. Um, so that, that was great to hear from all of you because it was a very different um, perspective from each of you. And so I'm wondering, you know, if, if a colleague of yours came to you uh, and said, hey, uh, I, I saw that you got the MCA award, you know, what, what would you tell them uh, in terms of your experience, uh, you know, recommending uh, that they develop a proposal? You know, what are some of the things that you'd tell them to look out for, be mindful of um, based upon your experience so far? Um, you know, if somebody had given you that, uh, advice before you developed your proposal, um, you know, what would you have liked to have to have learned from them? It's a very different proposal in the way you write it. It's more about you than anything else and, and thinking about how this is going to develop your career. Um, so it, it's not like a standard grant at all. Um, and particularly what you can fund, I mean, usually we'd like to fund a graduate student or a postdoc or someone like that, and you, you, you just can't do this. So it's, it's really about you and your development and thinking about that. And, and I think it was a good point earlier that your collaborators should get something out of it also. And hopefully this uh, helps you establish a new collaboration. Um, I mean, my collaborator and I are talking about the next grant already, you know, and I've only had this, this uh, award a year. So, um, you know, we're figuring out what data do we need that we can generate right now um, through this award that will lead to the next uh, grant. Um, I think for me, maybe the there are two things I would like to emphasize. One was, as Jennifer said, it's about us. It's about <laughs> the person. So. Uh, it's also, it was also a time to ask myself, right? What do I really want to do if people give you money to take care of yourself, right? <laughs> and you have the time to do things. So, so it's almost like a soul search, uh, searching process. If you find like indeed what you want to do, I think you can convey it in a really interesting and a passionate way. And, and in my case, I also tried to paint it in the bigger context of, okay, what's my longer, vision, not just about this particular three year, but in the longer term as well. Um, so that's one. And the other thing I, I have found really helpful was talking to the program uh, director or managers at NSF. So um, the MCA is kind of this cross uh, NSF umbrella, but then still you, you eventually are going to be looked at by individual programs on the technical side. So whether it's a good fit or not really depends on those programs. Um, 
at least in my own experiences, the program manager had been really helpful. Um, and even for um, like the later period when, when they already have, uh, I believe like reviews in, they are already trying to make decisions, uh, all of that. Um, yeah, so yeah, if uh, you, can, you can talk to them, yeah, it, I think it's one of the most helpful things. In fact, uh, in my case, uh, as I mentioned, I was uh, submitting to this PFI program, which require industrial collaborators or partners. Um, and the one thing that is always tricky <laughs> um, for those people who may not be so familiar with um, in terms of working with industries, you need to have certain agreement in place in order to move things forward. Um, and companies sometimes are really, really uh, uh, tricky to work with if you they want to put an agreement in place. So I was actually stuck, I would say, for some time. Um, and uh, without that, I actually couldn't really receive an, an award. And it was actually the program manager at NSF that uh, reached out to me and asked, oh, Nina, we haven't heard from you about this piece of a document. Uh, are you doing okay? So I actually had a chance to talk to her um, to figure out, okay, what is the way out? Um, so um, yeah, it, it, it's great to have program managers you can talk to, <laughs> yes. I, I definitely second everything that was that was mentioned. Talking to program uh, for NSF is critical. I think for broader impacts, threading that needle, you have a grant that's about you and you want to talk about broader impacts. And so making that transition was a little weird for me to, to write that. So having some helpful guidance uh, from, from the program folks was uh, was was invaluable. And then, uh, uh, yeah, of, of course, it is a very different structured, uh, grant structured very different in terms of, you know, focusing more on yourself. I would say one thing the program manager emphasized to me a lot was making the case that you need the protected time and that it's actually going to make a difference. And so that's sort of the burden of proof uh, for, for writing that grant was, you know, A, this is uh, training that, you know, if you receive it, uh, that, that it'll actually move the needle in some new direction, but, on, but also that you in fact do need to have that support, that uh, this isn't so close to what you're already doing, your boss would be happy for you to just do it right now. Uh, so I, I think that was a little, a little bit different, but yeah. Very good. So we have a few minutes left here. Uh, I wanted to see if uh, if folks would talk about how this fits into your your overall career to trajectory. And so Nina, for example, I think you had a career award from NSF uh, earlier on in your career. Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. so, you know, this this seems like a, a good logical next step to someone with a career award. You've got that initial research program that you've done, and you're maybe expanding that in new directions. So. Uh, you know, I don't know if you can speak to how that uh, having a career in the NCA maybe uh, impacted your direction, or, or we can also talk about where folks are going to go next uh, after you you complete this project. But um, happy to to hear any thoughts about how this fits into your overall career. Well, the career one is like the program is so established, so everybody knows, okay, if you get a career award, it's both funding, but also the really the prestigiousness of NSF award, right? I think the MCA uh, is really new that actually not many people are so aware of it. And I am uh, definitely feeling that NSF can really push this program off because we all need that. We like mid career faculty, we, we, we need more time. <laughs> yes, yeah, so uh, to me, yes, it's, it's, uh, it just makes sense to have this next program um, or this program for the next stage of faculty career. I'm not sure that adjusts your question, but <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what that's I thought of. Well, so Chris, you had talked about, um, you know, trying to sell this to your institution. Do you feel, uh, maybe too early at this point, but do you feel like you are able to tell the story of quantum plus bioinformatics as, as a new, um, you know, uh, place for you to go after this, this particular project ends? 
I, I, I think with the MCA, uh, it's, it's already yielded some fruit in, in, in that area because I have things to talk about it at various internal meetings and uh, we're starting to write up some papers uh, related to that work. And so the, there's already, it's already bearing fruit. And so it's, you know, my bosses are of course very happy to see that, uh, that, that this is actually not it's it's it, it, quantum computer I said it's not quite theoretical because few prototypes and things do exist but this isn't just a playground for for people to do sort of dirty math there really is something there's a there there which 10 20 years ago you might not have been able to convince people that this was uh it was just too theoretical and not practical enough but uh uh this is just happened to be at the right point in time and so yeah it's it's productive if i tried this 10 years ago probably still wouldn't work uh, but if I waited another 10 years, the field would be saturated. And so uh, I think I think the the message of getting early when it's uh, really starting to grow is uh, is something that resonates well. That's great. Yeah, and I guess my question really is sort of like we're, we've talked about this is a, a professional development kind of program, but it also you need to demonstrate those broader impacts. And so, you know, that that is a line that you're all trying to walk here. And so Jennifer, in your case, it sounds like, you know, this, this is a good evolution of your research and you have a new collaborator, you're doing new things. And so, you know, what, what's next for you uh, moving forward then? Yeah, I mean, this grant and, and papers, of course, are what I need for promotion. Um, so that that's a major part of, of this award is, you know, getting to the next level um and you know, just reinvigorating my career um uh i've spent so much time teaching and um uh working with undergraduates and research i ran a research um, experiences for undergraduates program for many years and, and that kind of sidetracked me so you know being able to concentrate more on uh uh you know the science ha is is great and you know i can also reinvigorate some of my teaching because mm -hmm. uh i'm the lone animal behavior person at my university and that's the course i teach well now i'm collaborating with someone who teaches it at another school so you know it's, it's great to be able to talk with her also about how do you do this course you know what mm -hmm. what are some of the things and, and bringing more um uh research into the classroom uh so you know that that's all been really exciting and so when i teach that course again a year from now um i, I think it'll be improved so um that'll make me happy also <laughs> that's great and that's that's clearly a broader impact if you're uh you know teaching the next generation of undergrads about what you're learning there. So that's that's fantastic. All right, I wanna be mindful of, of people's time here because we're near the end of the hour, uh, but thank you all so much for taking the time today to speak with us. Um, this has been really insightful to hear from you all. Um, I know that you have your uh, PI meeting this week uh, for the MCA program. So uh, I hope that goes well and you, you make some new uh, collaborators there uh, all as well. But um, Eleanor, thank you for your perspective from NSF. Um, we would be happy to uh, hear from, from folks in the audience or, or elsewhere uh, uh, watching the recording um, about ways that the hub can help support your uh, uh, MCA projects, uh, but also from NSF, you know, we're always happy to help uh, communicate the uh, and amplify the programs that you all have to support our community. So uh, it's great to have you here as well. Uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Jennifer and, and Nina as well for being here. Thank you for highlighting MCA and putting together this fabulous panel. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.